to More Living with Jim Brogan, your source of information for living the best years of your life, your way. For more than a decade, host Jim Brogan and his expert guests have come together each week to share important news and advice that can impact the lives and well-being of those who are retired and those nearing retirement. Learn about issues like health and fitness, financial planning, social security benefits, investment advice, and more. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Good morning, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Good. Brogan. Where it's all about Good morning, East Tennessee, and welcome to... Good morning. This is Jim Brogan. You're listening to More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I want to thank you for tuning in this morning. And uh, we got a great show in store for you. I'm, You know, I guess I am a little biased, but I have been a lot of different places. Uh, spent, I've mostly lived in Knoxville, Tennessee all my life. Uh, I did spend several summers in other locations in just in western North Carolina and Nashville, Tennessee, so it's not like, you know, I'm some big, you know, I haven't lived in a lot of other places. I've been a lot of other places, but de- definitely a little biased. But, you know, I think Knoxville is one of the best places to live. It is just, we have a fascinating history. It has a fun and creative vibe. We have access to the mountains, beautiful scenery. The arts in Knoxville are outstanding. Some of the most genuinely people I've met. You travel all over the world, you come back home. Some of the most genuinely nice people in Knoxville, Tennessee. There's still a lot about Knoxville that I don't know. You know, I still find it fun to go out and explore and find new places and learn more about them. You know, did you know that Knoxville was chosen as the capital of the Southwest Territory in 1790 and was actually the first capital of Tennessee in 1796? We have numerous historic structures, such as the Tennessee Theater, one of my very favorites, the Blunt Mansion, the Bijou Theater. They all have interesting stories, and no one knows this better than Jack Neely, the unofficial Knoxville historian and author. I think everybody pretty much considers him the historian for Knoxville. And uh, we had him on a few months ago, and I was so fascinated. And I mentioned, you know, I, I learned things, new things about Knoxville almost just regularly, And uh, when we had him on, it was so eye-opening, the things I learned about Knoxville that I did not know. And even in just talking to him off air, right before we came on today, I was like, man, I I didn't know all those things, just some of the things we were talking about. He currently serves as the executive director of the Knoxville History Project, and he has written several books about Knoxville and its history. He has a new book out. We're going to get to that. In 2017, Jack was presented with the Lifetime Achievement Award by the East Tennessee Riders Hall of Fame. Good morning, Jack. Thanks for joining us. Morning, Jim. Appreciate being here. It's great having you with us. Uh, Let's talk about your book. You came out with a new book late last year. That's right. Historic Knoxville, The Curious Visitor's Guide to Its Stories and Places. What can we expect from this book? Yeah, I, I've written a lot of books about a lot of specific things over the years, uh, Tennessee Theater, Market Square, and so forth. But this book is kind of answers the, all the basic questions people have about about the city of Knoxville. I, I've been, uh, you know, giving talks and tours and that sort of thing to people for many years, and these are the the things people are interested in knowing about. And uh, and this is uh, kind of a distillation of of everything in one in one kind of portable little book. It's it's. Uh, it it looks like a tourist guide, and it sort of is. We hope to, the tourists will pick it up and 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 walk around town and find something of interest. And I'm sure they will if they get, have the book. But uh, but it's it's also for people who've lived here their whole lives. So I, I hope that I I, think, I, I, I want to challenge people. I, I, I'm sure that no matter how, how long you've lived here and and how much you've read about local history, there's something in here that's going to surprise you where can people get the book it's right now it's at uh uh we're having a hard time negotiating with the uh big corporate bookstores but the uh it's in a lot of local places especially downtown uh union avenue books uh mass journal store um uh, bliss uh a lot of the, uh, the the history center a lot of these the the smaller local places are carrying the book and uh and and, and if, if you're if you're a retailer and want to carry the book give us a call we'll, we'll we, we prefer to deal with directly with the retailers and not deal with the it's it's amazing with the big corporate vendors they they insist on really really big profits for them and and have all sorts of rules that uh, we would we would prefer not to have to contend with in terms of of returns and that sort of thing and they can return it you know return a book in any condition apparently that's one of in their contract and and we have to figure out something else to do with it if if it gets damaged in route route to them we have to 
swallow that expense. But we'd rather just bring you a book, a box of books, and you can sell them, and and uh, that's that's how we're dealing with that now. So, well, I always learn so many fascinating things when I talk to you. Um, what changes, Jack, have you seen in Knoxville over the past few years that you think people should go out and discover? Oh, goodness. Uh, there, there's so many new parts of town that people didn't even know about that have been kind of opening up, uh, you know, especially like on the north side of downtown, uh, the Emory Place up to uh, Old Happy Holler. All these things are completely different from what they were just 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, lots of new, nice new places, restaurants and, and brew pubs and, and uh, little little shops and things. That, uh, you know, up and down, you know, the what used to be considered when I was in college, we would kind of dare each other to go to Happy Holler, you know, because that was where all the these uh, uh, bars were where you, would, you were likely to get in a fight if you weren't a regular, you know, you'd go there. And it was, it was kind of a challenge if you'd uh, uh, if you'd been down on the strip for a while and, and get bored with that, you'd, we'd go out to Happy Holler and just see uh, uh see what would happen but but now it's uh it's it's i was there just of the night at uh, flats and taps it's a it's a great uh, a great little place to walk around and, uh, and 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 see a part of the city you haven't seen before now you know a lot of cities have an identity you know nashville synonymous with country music mm-hmm. memphis has barbecue elvis knoxville Many people think Knoxville, Jack, doesn't seem to have that same defining factor. And historically, a lot of the national intention has knocked towards Knoxville, you know, scruffy, ugly. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think Knoxville should be known for? I, I think that uh, a good city, I mean, what's Chicago known for? It's known for lots and lots of things. I think a great city should be known for lots and lots of things. And I, I think that's what Knoxville is. It, it does have some country music. It has some college football. It has some, some deep history about the early pioneers. And it has great college basketball too that's true right suddenly it suddenly it does i have to get used to that idea I, i'm uh, that, that's that's something i'm not used to but yeah uh, but there there are probably 20 or so things that i it, it, liter from literature to music to uh and not just country music we have a good deal of country music but also a, a, an unusually deep classical music his, history and uh, a, lot, a lot of other things as well um, but I, I think a good city should should offer a, a spectrum of things to everybody that wants to. You know, a lot of people go to Nashville and think it's just. It, 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 to some extent, it's kind of like a. Uh, it it uh, kind of like a burden to bear if if you go to Nashville and you're not interested in country music. What you know, people uh, people I know who live in Nashville don't you know don't say it think that that's entirely a good thing that they're yeah sometimes so, the label's a bad thing yeah 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 i mean nashville, now, nashville's but, actually very diverse place yeah a yeah, hundred years ago they called themselves the athens of the south that was they were considered themselves a you know great center of learning and and uh and 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 uh that was to, to an older generation that's what it was so cities are always changing and they ought, ought to be but one thing about knoxville that i i think that we can use to a good advantage is that i think knoxville is a is a purely american city there's hardly any any city in america that has as much of a as much tells as much of the american story as knoxville does um because we almost everything that's happened in america has happened here in one way or another and and uh, we have uh, just a, a variety of of you know from political to to cultural uh, things that have happened here and, and almost everything that's happened in america is, is reflected or spawned out of uh, knoxville and yeah, and as a matter of fact um, and with something we were talking about off air, I wasn't really going to get to this, but um, we've had a Knoxvillian on the U.S. Supreme Court. That's right. Right? That's right. Yeah, there, there's a brand new book about about him. His name is Edward Terry Sanford. And he's kind of, a, uh, has been considered kind of an also ran in a way, uh, you know, he was, uh, 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 and I, I think partly because he was considered a, a Republican and conservative. People say, oh, it, 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 he's predictable, uh, don't, you know, not even worth talking about. Um, but he was uh, he was uh, put in during the Harding administration and, and served until his rather sudden and and and, and peculiar death. He died the same day as as the Chief Justice uh, 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 Taft, uh, William Howard Taft, um, in 1930. Um, and that's one one of the one of the things that kind of distinguishes him, but also kind of overshadows him in a way. But um, but he was uh, he was from here and it was a very thoughtful guy and, and actually made some important legislation, uh, wrote some important opinions that have been used in civil rights legislation and other things over the years in, in the 1920s. And but there's a brand new book about him uh, by Stephanie Slater. Uh, uh, I, I think it has just his uh, his name as the title. Uh, a very thick book. She went really thoroughly into his background, but has a really interesting background. He was raised here in Knoxville with a, a father who was from Connecticut, 
was a guy who arrived here with nothing in the 1850s and became a, one of the big uh, movers and shakers in industry here. Uh, and a mother who was from a French-Swiss family. So he grew up speaking French here in Knoxville. Uh, so that, that's kind of unusual, something about him. But he uh, became very well respected here on the bench uh, and was, uh, but was uh, you know, eventually tapped for the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah, and, amazing. Uh, and, uh, but there's a you know, very thick book. And Stephanie's going to be at our, uh, we, once a month, we, on the third Thursday of every month, we have a, 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 a public uh, gathering, and just a, kind of a, a free lecture at the bowling alley downtown, Maple Hall. Um, and uh, it, they have a nice restaurant kind of above the, the, the lanes. And uh, we have a, uh, we're going to have her at, over and have her talking about this book and about this guy's I- interesting uh, and, and, and thoughtful life. Uh, now, the, the word scruffy, the scruffy city, is kind of interesting. Uh, many, and actually in a recent New Sentinel poll, many Knoxvillians don't like that title that that billing what does that really mean what does jack think of that and then we're going to get it we're going to have that when we come back we're also going to get into many many more things of fascinating history here in knoxville so definitely stay tuned as we visit with knoxville historian and writer jack neely right here on news talk 98 7 woki you are listening to more living with jim brogan During the week, Jim is a financial advisor, an author and speaker with an MBA from the University of Tennessee who specializes in helping people in or near retirement plan for the next phase of their lives. You can reach Brogan Financial during the week at 865-862-6800 or on the web at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan, and we are visiting with Jack Neely, Knoxville writer and historian, just fascinating he, he, I swear, I think he knows everything about Knoxville's history, and it just is fascinating to learn all the different things. When we had him on several months ago, I learned so much, and I've been here all my life. I love Knoxville. I think it's one of the greatest places to live, and actually, we're going to get into that in a minute because there seems to be some disagreement on how great a place it is to live. But before we get to that, let's talk about this scruffy, the word scruffy. It seems like there sometimes has been some controversy surrounding call, uh, Knoxville calling Knoxville the scruffy city. And the the Knoxville News Sentinel conducted a poll, and over 80% of the respondents stated they didn't think Knoxville should still bill itself as scruffy. You know, you had your column, Jack, the scruffy citizen in the Knoxville Mercury. So what's your opinion? Why, why do you think Knoxville's called that, and do you think it fits? Yeah, well, certainly when uh, a, a, a writer for the Wall Street Journal back in 1980 called Knoxville, uh, and she was actually disparaging Knoxville and saying she didn't think it was ready for a World's Fair back in 1980. And that's, that, that was the origin of the, the term uh, when she said, this is just a scruffy little city by the Tennessee River. How can they expect to host a World's Fair? Um, and uh, certainly nobody was flattered by that at the time. But I remember anybody that remembers the World's Fair, they, they remembers that toward the end of it, they had uh, T-shirts that said the scruffy little city did it and uh, were, uh, were, became proud of it. And in years to come, uh, things that uh, uh, adjectives around the, around the country that, that we would not think of as necessarily positive, like the word weird, uh, in, uh, in, and I think Austin, Texas might have started this this uh, movement to keep Austin weird, and there's keep Portland, Oregon weird, uh, and even closer to home, uh, Asheville does the same thing, keep Asheville weird. Well, we could say keep Knoxville, and this is kind of a, something that appeals to hipsters and people who like the idea that something's so different that it's surprising and, and odd and, and strange and in creative ways. Um, but some uh, some we could we could just get on the weird band, bandwagon and say keep Knoxville weird. Uh, but but I, I think it's more creative to do what what uh, some downtown entrepreneurs and, and do and, and say keep Knoxville scruffy, uh, which it makes it it makes it different. It, it's not a word that's connected to any other city that I know of. And there's there's something uh, um, kind of endearing about it to me. Um, it, you can you can uh, get well, it's it. part of the, I think that's part of the just part of the history, right? Yeah, it just yeah. is. You know, it's interesting. The world's and then I'm going to show my pride here. And I'm going by memory here from 30 years ago when I was. I mean, in 1982, I was 13. I turned 13 that summer. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, but what I remember is, of course, it was a huge success. The World's Fair. Mm-hmm. And I think two years later, if my memory serves me correct, the World's Fair was in New Orleans. 
Yeah. And we outdrew them by double. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was a tremendous success when they had that here. It it was. It uh, it it paid its bills, which is kind of unusual for a World Sphere to, to be able to do that. Yeah, 11, 11 million people came. And, of course, the Sun Sphere is probably Knoxville's most iconic structure, and it is a remnant from the World's Fair. Um, what are some initiatives or events in Knoxville's history that fizzled out and, in your opinion, maybe should be brought back to life? Oh, goodness, that's a really good question. Um, uh, there, there are some things that have been kind of brought back to life. It, it's surprising that back in the 1880s, we had a, uh, a new music festival. Uh, it, it was just called the Music Festival. That's what it was called, but it was, it was mainly... Uh, uh, opera and classical music back then, and that was the the new music. Then the new surprising music was the the opera from Europe that was coming over, and and there were there were big name uh, stars from Boston and New York, and even from Europe who came to Knoxville for this festival. And this kind of is in in a different and interesting way is kind of like our Big Ears Festival, which uh, which started about ten years ago, and and it's uh, it's this this internationally known festival. Uh, that has a lot of you know, brand new artists that are surprising even to fellow musicians. And a lot of people who come to the to that festival are musicians and people in the music industry. And people come from as far as uh, as England and Australia and other places to see, to, to Knoxville for that those four days to see the Big Ears Festival. Uh, but I'm trying to think of other things. Which that alone, I mean, yeah. the Big Ears Festival's become such a big thing. That's right, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just unbelievable some of the things that have developed. It, you're right. The and biscuit festival's a really cool big thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just seems like one thing after another just keeps popping up and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're right. The, the bigger festival, even it's, it's kind of expensive, and and they, I think it's just a few hundred people come to it, maybe a couple thousand come to it. But it's uh, it's gotten Knoxville more positive press than anything I can think of, even including uh, athletic uh, events, because uh, sports writers come here and they talk about the balls. That's that's all they talk about. But music writers come here and they talk about what a great city this is, and because yeah. they go to the venues, they say, "Gosh, you got got to see the Tennessee Theater, or you got to see the, here the Bijou Theater." That some uh, a uh, New York Times writer a few years ago, uh, Ben Ratliff, who's been to every single Big Ears Festival so far, uh, uh, came to the Bijou and said, "This may be one of the best listening rooms in America. This is a, a, a great place to hear any kind of music." Um, and uh, and this was uh, something we you know, hadn't really appreciated about the Bijou over the years. Now this weekend. We have a chocolate festival. That's right. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about the history of the candy factory. Yeah. Because that's got quite a history as well, right? You're, you're, you're right. You're right. I, I wrote uh, in uh, in the Visit Knoxville website, I wrote kind of a, uh, I have a blog in there, but I usually don't go into the detail, the depth uh, in, into the uh, blogs for them that I that I did for this one. But I, I went, uh, I did some actual new research for this because I was curious about the subject about how much candy manuf- was manufactured in Knoxville over the years. And it started back with, in the mid-19th century when these, all these German refugees were coming over after the, uh, what they called the Spring of Nations fizzled. It was like the, it was uh, in 1848, there were lots of revolutions that turned out really badly and things were worse afterwards than they had been before uh, for Germans and Italians and Austrians and several other people. But, but a lot of these people end up in Knoxville. And it's interesting how many... Uh, uh, Germans and Austrians landed here, uh, including Peter Kern, who started Kern's Bakery. That uh, a lot of us grew up, you know, with Kern's bread. But in his day, in his early days, I think Peter Kern was at least as well known, maybe better known, as a candy manufacturer in uh, in the 1870s and that that era. And he was, he was from Germany. He made chocolates and other kinds of candies, um, and uh, became known for that. Making them right there on Market Square at the old Kern's building there, uh, the original Kern's uh, before they moved to. They moved to Chapman Highway many years later, but uh, but back in the old days, they were on Market Square. But he had uh, three or four competitors, including the Kuhlman family and the and uh, the Spiro family, who were all parts of this wave of refugees that came over in, uh, in the mid-19th century, and they were all making candy and competing with each other. And out of this came uh, a couple of guys who were originally from up north uh, named Littlefield and Steer, um, who, uh, who came here while Kern was still alive and making candy. And they began, got into this, uh, into this business and, and started making candy downtown first. And then they did so well, they, they had a national uh, business. And unlike, Kern was mainly selling in the South. Uh, Littlefield and Steer were selling, I think, to 32 states and in and, and several foreign countries. Uh, but they built their candy factory that we know is a candy factory on the World's Fair Park area there, so, which is now a, 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 a condo uh, uh, a residential thing. Which, but it's, uh, uh, it, 
it, uh, it, it's interesting that that's still there and it's still called a candy factory and that revived during the World's Fair as a candy factory. But it, they went out of business back in the Depression, but, um, but they were there for, for you know, a few decades. And yeah, so quite a history there. We yeah, didn't yeah, even realize right, that there yeah, were a lot of, yeah. you know, on the candy side. Yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned the livability of Knoxville and I think Knoxvillians are kind of pr- pride by him about it seems like we're always named as one of the most livable cities. Um, in 2018, livability.com named Knoxville one of the top 10 best affordable places to live. A 2018 study from 24-7 Wall Street came out, labeled us the number 36 least livable cities in the yeah, U.S. Yeah. Don't know really. So there was some split opinion. Why do you think that was? And what do you think? What What do you think makes Knoxville such a great place to live? Yeah, I haven't read that Wall Street uh, study. And I, I guess it depends on what your criteria are, obviously, what, uh, you know, what, you know, if, if you need a, a a pro football team in a city, you, uh, this is not the place for you, probably. But, but uh, most most usually have us pretty high for most livable. Yeah, Why do you think that? Right. What makes Knoxville always stand out like that? I, I think we have a big variety of different things here. We we haven't had just, uh, we never relied on one or two or three industries. It's always been lots of different kinds of industries so that there's a little bit of everything. There's almost nothing you can name in America that you might want to see that you wouldn't have access to if you came if you came to Knoxville, if, if you like Broadway shows, you can see them at the Tennessee Theater. If you like opera, they got that. Uh, if you like uh, gelato, uh, uh, they got that. We got that. You know, it, got a, it, we got a great orchestra. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, I think the oldest orchestra in the South. Okay, yeah. So, but um, um, but uh, but we have a, a, a thriving downtown, which I think is a is a great thing, and with um, with Market Square and 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 the old city kind of coming back some, and uh, and, uh, and and just uh, there's a lot of that there's a lot of value in that as well, I think. Um, now in nineteen or excuse me, twenty nineteen, nineteen, I can't believe I said not to, like nineteen, <laughs> not twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. One of the projects that the Knoxville History Project has planned. Regards the mayors of Knoxville. That's right. And in the 227-year history, we've had 80 men and one woman, Mm -hmm. who, of course, is finishing out her term. What can you tell us about this project and its importance? Yeah, well, the the, the city's uh, uh, putting in a, uh, a a gallery of mayors. They've had lots of these old portraits, and they these some of them have been like in private homes, like in hanging in living rooms and stuff over the years. And they've kind of gotten them all together, portraits of mayors, and they have portraits of most of the mayors going back to. Uh, uh, the, the the first one whose name was uh, was was Emerson back in uh, in 1815. We didn't have a mayor in the early days because it was run by because we were the state capital. We were run by the state legislature more or less. They just uh, they made all the decisions for the city. Um, but the uh, it, it, it there are quite a few surprises among the mayors uh, that we've had over the years. And I want to bring out just the all the individual stories. These are all individual people who came here from different places. Some of them were from here, but some of them were from far away. It's surprising that there were four or five mayors who were immigrants. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it's interesting to think of a mayor who might have a German accent uh, is mayor of Knoxville or, or a British accent, and we've had a few of those, Irish accent. Um, these were uh, they, people who came from, from overseas and, and ended up being mayor of, of Knoxville, and it's a uh, um, and, and it's surprising even look back on, you know, in fact, city council sometimes had more than one immigrant on them uh, back in the 1880s and 90s. Peter Curran himself was mayor. I mentioned him earlier, mm-hmm. was from Germany, um, in the Heidelberg area. So, uh, and, you know, before we get to our break here, um, you know, there's if, if we just kind of try to lay aside the politics of, of things, if you just look at the last 15 or 20 years in the different leadership, mm-hmm. and we just look at how Knoxville has developed and grown, and man, maybe there's some negative things to that, too. We might we get into that in the next segment, maybe, but um, it's just been tremendous the way, I mean, the downtown revitalization, now we're working on South Knoxville. I mean, there's just so many great things that have happened. Yeah, yeah. And it's right. just becoming better and better and better. And it's almost like, you know, I guess the population in Knoxville and the surrounding counties is pushing 900,000. I think, and we want to, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people that don't, do not want to hit us, see us hit a million, because then you start showing up on certain, like, you know, people search for that kind of stuff when they're picking places to live yeah. and move and things like that. And some people want us to keep us under that <laughs> so that it doesn't show, so then it doesn't explode into, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's something to be said for the charm of what we have right now. You know, and it's hard to convince people to stop reproducing, I suppose. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're told to buy low and sell high, right? But that is not what people do. When we come back, we've got our dollars and cents segment. What do I mean by that? Why is it most people buy low, buy high, and sell low? 
And what does it mean for you and your planning? Don't go away. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Through his weekly radio show, television news appearances, and adult education classes taught at the University of Tennessee and Pellissippi State Community College, Jim taps into his extensive knowledge and experience to address issues important to living your best retirement. Join Jim every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI and visit him online at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We've been visiting with Jack Neely, Knoxville writer and historian. It's just fascinating to talk to him. Uh, about the history of Knoxville before we, and he has a new book out. Before we get back to Jack, however, it is time for dollars and cents. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. Buy low and sell high. That's the way we're supposed to win in investing, right? And the best way to do that is over long periods of time because markets over long periods of time go up. They don't go up over shorter periods of time all the time. But is that really what investors do? Do investors buy low and sell high? Uh, Emotionally, no, it's not what investors typically do. A lot of investors buy high and sell low. Investors kind of ran for cover in 2018, according to the latest data from Morningstar. Net inflows into index funds, exchange-traded funds, were the lowest in 2018 since 2008. We had, in the year 2018, we had net flows into U.S. funds totaled $157 billion. Uh, By contrast, in 2017, we had net inflows of $700 billion. So, 2017, $700 billion net inflows into stock ETFs. And then in 2018, we had 157. So, it was cut down more than 75. I guess that's more than 75%. So, think about that for a minute. What were markets doing in 2017? What were markets doing in 2018? Markets in 2017 were up a good bit, right? 2017 was a very good year in the stock market. 2018 was a negative year in the stock market. And 20, of course, the fourth quarter drop was more than 12%. So here's what happens. Markets are way up. Everything's going great. People just buy in. Markets correct. They go down. People sell when they're down. And that's a recipe for disaster. In line with that trend was the increase in inflows to the relative safety of money market funds, which in 2018 saw an inflow of $162 billion, which is much more than normal. So in other words, we had more money going into money market funds than into stock funds. So, you know, I was listening to a conversation about a month ago. Uh, I guess it was maybe a month and a half ago. And the market was almost at its low. The low was 20, December 24th. Uh, from it was its low day where we almost hit bear market status and they were talking about hey what did you do i got out of the market last week markets are just too chaotic right now they're going to continue going down and then that's the worst thing they could have done in mid-december so the the lesson in this is not I'm, i'm not telling you go out and put all your money back into the markets i'm telling you you should have a plan that takes out the timing of when we have good and bad markets. And that's what a good financial plan does. And a good financial plan like that invests regularly, periodically, with tip, ideally every month, regardless of where markets are priced, so that when they're down, you keep buying while they're down, even though it may be hard to buy when they're down because everybody's gloom and doom. And then when you're in income, when you're going into retirement and you're already or you're already retired, you have a plan to draw out investments that are secure and stable in the early years of retirement. So you don't have to go to, you're not depending on selling off stock funds when markets are down. 
I mean, you shouldn't be living on variable assets in retirement. You shouldn't be selling off investments and spending the money periodically in retirement because inevitably your investments are, your, the market's going to be down. And that means when they're down, you're selling them off and spending the money. And you don't want to do, you don't want to be selling when things are down. I mean, it's okay to sell when things are down and reinvest. You never want to sell and spend the money because you'll compound your losses. The money will never, ever come back because you've spent it. You also, so you don't want to, you don't want to spend losses and you don't want to stop buying when markets are down, when you're investing, when you're in your younger years. So you need a financial plan that, that accomplishes all those things. And then what that does, it takes a lot of the emotion out of the equation. You know, we know that market timing really doesn't work. It doesn't mean we can't be strategic about what we see. You know, we're at the front end of probably an historic bear market in traditional U.S. bonds, and most investors haven't adjusted for that fact. That's not market timing. That's strategic planning. But be careful with the market stuff. You know, everybody say, people have been saying for three years, markets that are all-time highs, they're going to, we're going to have a bear market. You know what? We will have a bear market eventually. We don't know when. It could happen next month. It could happen in two years. So now the longer term, it's, you know, we can kind of get a feel for where things are going when we look out maybe eight or 10 years. And I've talked at length on this program. That's not the subject of today's dollars and cents, but don't let emotion get in the way and, 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 and where you stop buying when things are down and you start selling when things are high, then you, you buy high and you sell low. And that's not a good recipe for success. So the way you, 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 you take emotion as much as we can out of the equation by planning for risk before it happens, having an investment plan that takes advantage of risk, and having an income plan that reduces the impact of risk. That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting broganfinancial.com. Please go to BroganFinancial.com. I want to mention my upcoming class. Uh, I've got my next class is this Tuesday. It's the next two Tuesdays at the University of Tennessee. It's adult education, non-credit, two two two-hour sessions, February the 5th and the 12th. If you're going to the Missouri basketball game, you're fine because the, the class is 630 to 830. It's the downtown conference center. You can easily get over to Thompson Bowling Arena for 9 o'clock tip-off. If that's what you're doing, that's what I'm doing. I will be at that game. So we will end that class on time. <laughs> I guess a good way to say that. But uh, in that class, I cover seven main things that I think everybody needs to know about their retirement planning and wealth management in retirement. So if you're near retirement or, or, or you're already retired, if you're within about five years or you're already retired, I'd urge you to come and be equipped with information to make informed decisions that can impact the quality of your life in retirement. You can go to... Uh, the name of the class is Financial Survival for Retirement. So you can go to financialsurvivalforretirement.com and you can download the syllabus to see what those, those seven topics are. You can also click the link to register with the University of Tennessee. It's $59. If you want to get the couple's discount of $99, you do need to call the University of Tennessee. Uh, that, that number's on the web, that website. It's 9740150. I would love to see you there. If you can't make it there, my next class in Hardin Valley in West Knoxville is in March. You can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com for more information about that. It's the, I think it's the 5th and 12th. It might be the 7th and 14th. No, it's the 5th and 12th of, of March. So, uh, and, and if, and, and then I'm in Maryville in, in, in uh, April, back in Knoxville in, in May. You can find the full schedule at broganfinancial.com. Click on classes for more information. I would love to see you there as I try to equip you to make informed and prudent decisions about your money that can affect your life in a positive way. We're visiting this morning with Jack Neely. Uh, he is a writer and historian. Uh, it's always fascinating to hear the different things about Knoxville. And, you know, Jack, because of the research that you've done, you doubtless have many interesting statistics and facts about Knoxville. We've heard some today that many people aren't aware of. What is one of your favorites that tends to surprise people? Yeah, well, one is uh, that came out a few years ago, and some people were taken aback like by this, by kind of as a they might be by the word scruffy, but but uh, a, a demographer in New York was asked the question of uh, what is the most average city in America, and he didn't mention that he'd ever been to Knoxville, but he said, "I keep coming back to that. I keep coming back to Knoxville, Tennessee." He said, "Demographically, we're more like America as a whole than any other city that he can think of." 
uh, and that's that's interesting. And and to me, that's uh, that's good news. I, mean, I think to a to a journalist or or, or a historian, that's that makes Knoxville interesting because it, it means we've got a little bit of everything here. Um, and another thing, though, uh, that I looked at over the years, and I and I didn't realize this until I compared us. Uh, I, I did. Uh, I used to do a lot of just silly fun things for Metropoles years ago. And one of them was to go to the second biggest Knoxville in America, which is Knoxville, Iowa. And uh, and I spent about a week there in in writing about this place. And I and I began comparing the two of them. I thought Knoxville, Iowa, it looks very interesting and different uh, in, um, it, it, from Knoxville, Tennessee. I wonder what the difference is. And it turns out that what made it seem different in some ways was that uh, in Knoxville, Iowa, everybody is demographically very much alike. And in Knoxville, Tennessee, we have both more PhDs and more people with master's degrees, people with graduate degrees than average, but also more high school dropouts than average. That's possible if you think about it. We, what we don't, what we have less of is is middle class people here. We, but we have we have the the high, more highs and more lows than than the average American city does. Which, as you talk about that, uh, the, my initial reaction because we talk about how Knoxville kind of reflects. In, in a mi- little microcosm of the entire United States, that's yeah. happening in the United States. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe, maybe we're ahead of the curve in a way that way, but yeah, for yeah. better or worse. Tell you what, we're going to get to our last break. When we come back, we're going to have more with Jack, so don't go away. This is More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thank you for listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. If you miss any of today's show or want to listen to it again, visit BroganFinancial.com where you can access the podcast and other educational materials to help you in your journey through retirement. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. We're visiting with Jack Neely. He's an Knoxville writer and historian. And uh, if you uh, missed it earlier, be sure to check out Jack's new book, Historic Knoxville, The Curious Visitor's Guide to Its Stories and Places. You can find that especially at, the, at many of the local bookstores. You won't want to miss that. It's just fascinating. Uh, it's written kind of a, almost to be great for tourists, but it's also great for us to learn more about our history. But that means it's going to be a great, easy read and just, just laid out great. Um, Jack Knoxville was recognized in 2018 as a member of AARP's Network of Age-Friendly Communities. Mm-hmm. And it's frequently listed as a great place to retire. I think its location, its affordability, its access to amenities. How does the experience of living in Knoxville change as you age? Uh, that's uh, that's interesting. I, I think one big issue with uh, with aging and and uh, in, in, in living in a, in a particular city is uh, transportation and. Uh, I think for many years Knoxville had an issue because we were mainly suburban and people wanted to live in the in the houses where they raised their families and you know and that might be uh, it, you know as you get get past eighty or so sometimes you have issues with uh, with driving and you'd rather rather be able to to use public transportation or walk and that just wasn't an option for a lot of people you really had to hire people to to drive you to the doctor's office or whatever. Uh, but now uh, there's at least an option of people to live downtown, and a lot of the, the people who live uh, live downtown in these, uh, like in the Holston Building and places like that, are, are older folks, and they and they can they can get out and walk around. I know a, a, there's a lady who's 90 years old who comes to a lot of her our events downtown, and she I don't know I don't think she drives, but she she comes to lots of things because she can can walk to them, and um, and that's that's one one big option that we have that uh, that we didn't really think about that. I think when we suburbanize and we started thinking, gosh, everybody's going to be driving cars. Well, some people, you know, due to eyesight or, or Alzheimer's or whatever else, they, could, they probably shouldn't be driving. And, and now we ha- at least have an option for a lot of these people uh, that, uh, that you, can, you, can, you can walk around and, and get, get public transportation to. Well, there certainly are a lot of people that move here to retire, and yeah. uh, it's just a great place to live even in retirement. But yeah. it just kind of underscores the livability of Knoxville. Yeah. And there are lots of, th- yeah, lots of things. In a positive way, there's lots of things to do. I mean, in, in retirement here and from you know cultural museums to to you know symphony orchestra things and 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 ball games and everything else and you might want to, to to spend your time your retirement years doing there's a lot continuing to be developed in knoxville jack what are you excited to see from knoxville coming up in the next five to ten years 
Oh goodness, it's hard to it's hard it's hard to predict. It's hard to predict something like the Big Ears Festival that just came, came almost out of nowhere. And uh, these interesting festivals, these ethnic festivals that have popped up. We now have an Asian festival, you know, and and all these things. Um, I, I wonder how many more brew pubs we can handle. We have how many breweries in town now? It seems like a you know twenty or so. It's uh, it, and and every one is exciting to young people who who uh, who drink a lot of beer. But uh, I, I wonder if I, I would like to see something uh, interesting and surprising pop up. I'll, I, I can't say what it would be, I, I, it, but. But like something like the bowling alley downtown, that that was something that uh, that that was. I, I think it was a, not a restaurant, it was not a bar, uh, it was not a, another store. It was a bowling alley, you know. I think something I, I, something yeah, a little bit out, out of the box, place. just something something different. Uh, yeah. to, to, what about the development on the south side on the waterfront there? Oh I mean, yeah, that's yeah, going to be exciting. That, you're, to yeah, see, you're right? absolutely right. You're absolutely right about that. Uh, yeah. And uh, and that's there's I have high hopes for that. That that's something that uh, kind of an obvious thing. It's amazing all the development downtown. Walk across the Gay Street Bridge, and it's a lovely walk to walk across the Gay Street Bridge. It's, it's less than, you know, it, it's, it takes about, what, eight minutes or so to walk across the bridge. And there's, for years, it's just been nothing. You get over there, and there's not even a sidewalk. But uh, but now things are popping up and, and, and happening. You got the, you know, Regal is already uh, sitting over there, and, and there's uh, lots of new city uh, greenways. And, and, of course, Sutry Landing Park. I did a, a walk last summer uh, from during on a history fair day from from downtown over to Sutter Landing Park, and it's maybe about a 20-minute walk over there, way, yeah. all the way over there. Jack, I mentioned your, your book, Historic Knoxville, The Curious Visitor's Guide to Its yeah. Stories and Places. How can, I mentioned local bookstores, how can people get hold of your book? Yeah, yeah, if, if you can't find it, it can't get down to one of the downtown bookstores, and it seems to be mostly in the downtown bookstores right now, downtown stores, um, uh, just uh, get in touch with us uh, through our website, uh, knoxvillehistoryproject.org. Uh, and we can uh, we you can just order one from from us uh, directly if you'd like, but yeah, it's, it's like something, nothing ever done. It's got about like more than two hundred color pictures in there, and it's got fold out maps and and all sorts of uh, things about neighborhoods, things about UT campus. So it, it's it's uh, it's got a lot of of, of information of, of interest. Some people have told me they haven't been able to put it put it down literally. They they just read it until they finished it. And you're the executive director of the Knoxville History Project. How can people find out more about that and the different things you do for outreach and and walking tours? And how can people find out more information to learn yeah. more about Knoxville? Yeah, yeah. Easiest way is to come to our website, knoxvillehistoryproject.org. And we have a, a list of our upcoming events. So like our, our our parlor talk at the bowling alley is on the next one is on the 21st, I think. And it's just a fun night. You can come there and have supper if you want to and have a few drinks. And, and we have a kind of usually a slide presentation and talk about history. And it's kind of a, becomes a discussion and people talk about what they remember and and uh, and it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a fun night, but we we do lots of these things that kind of uh, uh, over the over the over the year. So that's knoxvillehistoryproject dot com dot org dot yeah, org yeah. knoxvillehistoryproject dot org. Jack Neely, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. My pleasure. Us. Thank you. Jim. Today we've discussed our history because a greater community provides for more living, so you can live the best years of your life your way. Check out our upcoming classes at broganfinancial dot com. Click on classes. Thank you for tuning in. As this is more living here on News Talk. 98.7 WOKI.